All right, guys, we got a really special episode for you guys on the Bronco. We're gonna go over all the important things to actually make your truck run. Whether it's a Hemi or an LS or a Coyote, we go over fuel, wiring, plumbing, and power steering. And throwing an engine into a frame rail is super exciting, but this is the stuff that you really gotta pay attention to. We wanna show you guys exactly how to do it. On top of that, until the end of the month, we are giving away a gear wrench toolbox. So if you go to our website and every dollar that you spend goes towards an entry, and if you buy a calendar, which are slowly becoming irrelevant through, as the farther we go through the year, you get an additional 100 entries for that because we don't want to see those go in the garbage. We want to see those hanging in your shop, motivating you beside your nice toolbox and your project car so you're excited to get in the shop and work on stuff. This stuff is a little frustrating, but plan for it properly. Know what you're getting into and it'll make the swap go that much easier. So let's get into it. Very excited. Here we go. the colors that we went with. This thing has been super good to us and has done more than it ever intended to do. We probably put more miles on this thing in the last year than in the previous 20, 30 put together. Exciting day, this is better than Christmas because it's unwrapping a dream that I've had for a couple years. A bull nose Bronco with a 5.0 Coyote. In. Customizing custom parts since 2015. I said in the beginning of this thing that I'm not gonna get carried away with this, but it's just something that I do, I guess. I just can't let it go. It's in the shop anyway. Might as well do it right. And that's why projects take so long. Okay, so first thing, we got a lot bigger engine in here, a lot more power, so we need more fuel. So we have a EFI system on here. If you guys remember with Vice Grip Garage, we put uh, a sniper on the old 302 and that supplied enough fuel for that 140, 150 horsepower. But uh, Deechworks hit us up with some pump and lines, and we're going to redo the fuel system. So funny thing, um, when we did do the fuel system, there is a steel line, a steel fuel line here that supplies the fuel. We paid attention to it here, where we just put a pump and that on the tank and a filter and a pre-filter and an after filter. And then we paid attention to it where it connected to the engine. And we drove about 7,000 miles like that. And then I got it home and it was relatively trouble free. Other than the tank, um, all the rust falling down from inside the tank because these vehicles, when they get older, people don't fill the tank right to the top. Then they throw 20 bucks in there or 10 bucks in there off a jerry can. The top of the tank rusts. And when you drive it home 7,000 uh, miles, you fill up the tank and then you knock all that rust off on the top of the tank and it falls in the bottom of the tank. So we emptied and cleaned the tank, so you can see that video, just using a differential and some chains and some uh, rocks. And um, anyway, we kept driving it and I'm like, okay, let's drive with the girls. And what happened was, Ford likes to stick this little piece of rubber hose in between the steel line, front to back, um, and, and I did not know about that. I think that that must be where there was a filter and somebody took that filter out and uh, put a little plastic or a little rubber line in there. So I'm driving with my girls down the beach and all of a sudden they start smelling fuel. And I'm like, what is that smell? I look behind me and the entire road is covered in fuel. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so of course I got my girls with me and uh, that line blew apart. Luckily I had enough line left over from uh, some slack at the front of the engine. I was able to replace it with a dime and uh, get home. Uh, well, well, get another 10 minutes down the road after the fix because then I ran out of fuel. So met some nice people and uh, got home. But regardless, we are going to replace this entire fuel system and make it top of the line and nice and neat. And we're going to paint everything in the frame at the same time. So first things first, going to remove those lines, remove those pumps. I'm not going to video that. That's really easy. And then we'll, uh, we'll get to it. Oh, look at that nice gear effects. Nine inch, oh, she's a beaut, Clark. 
Here we go. I love this part because you can just get rid of all the parts that you don't really need and start over new. Okay, everything's painted, under oil underneath here. Looks good. It's, it's, it's weird, it's all one color, it's just the light shows, makes it shiny in one way and dull in another, but got a nice coat, it looks good. So next thing is, I gotta drop that tank again, because I gotta pull that, uh, we had the return line going into the filler neck, we're gonna do it proper this time, and have it coming right out of the sending unit. Make sure that the gauge is working properly, and, uh, and then we can start running our lines. So I'm not sure how much fuel was in there because the engine just blew up halfway home. So we'll see. Probably lots. And it's, I'm probably going to get it all over me. And that's the end of the day. And then I'm going to stick up the whole house. It's going to be awesome. Well, it seems pretty heavy. So knowing me, we pulled over at a gas station because I heard a big bang. I thought it was a suspension, but uh, more than likely I filled up right before it blew up. Don't be like that. Let go. I pain it. Always oh, so Fairly full. All right, spray underneath here. Now this is why you buy rust-free vehicles. Everything's painted underneath, looks really, really good. Um, and now might as well paint the fuel tank. And I, I said in the beginning of this thing that I'm not gonna get carried away with this, but it's just something that I do, I guess. I just can't let it go. It's in the shop anyway, might as well do it right. I'm not the guy to shove it out and worry about it later. Now is the time to do it, might as well do it. And that's why projects take so long. But I'm gonna drain the fuel out of that, put that in the 06, it can burn that off. That's a year old now. And then we'll splash some paint on that, and then we can start running our fuel lines. There we go. All right, so for the fuel tank, just a quick brush with some trim clad black. Uh, you don't have to get too carried away. Pressure wash both just to make sure that uh, there's no dirt on there. A little bit of rust doesn't matter with the trim clad paint. You just put a nice thick coat on there. All the brush strokes kind of run into each other. And then uh, it's like putting on another sweater. Just a, another sweater over top of that fuel tank to make it last another 20 years. Let's see what we got. Feed line, it's a return line. Nice. Black, not some weird color that doesn't match the rest of the truck. Like bright red or orange. Wonderful. We got all our fittings to go start to finish. Nice, so we'll unwrap those. Fuel pressure regulator, mounting kit. Oh, look at that filter. That is just beautiful. Got a nice pump. I'm sure that will be quieter than what's on there. Pre-filter and after filter. Nice. So while the paint's drying on the fuel tanks, I'm gonna start running my fuel lines to the back. Uh, so we're underneath the hood here. Um, got our fuel rails here, the nice uh, holly ones. We're going to move the connection between the two towards the front. We got these really nice covers that cover up this side here, so everything's kind of hidden underneath there. I don't know why I had it at the back. I think I couldn't get the fuel line at the back because it was too tight up against the, the Mustang, but here we got lots of room. So I'm gonna run the fuel line down behind there, 
Our fuel regulator is going to go right there so we can keep, we can see it. There's a bolt right there so we can actually make a mount go right onto that bolt. That'll be just fine. Because this is the regulator. Uh, fuel coming in, fuel coming out. So basically, this adjustment screw controls whatever pressure you want up to this. So it's basically blocking, it's pinching off that end of that hose so that the pressure in the hose is always the same amount but it regulates how much it pinches off that's your boost control so if you've got added boost it will add more fuel to make sure that you don't lose any fuel and this is a nice little bracket to mount it you can flip the bracket around so you can have it sitting on top underneath this way so find the nicest spot where you can see it you can put it in on any one of these ports and that is your pressure port to uh, put a gauge so or a sensor on there so you can read your fuel pressure so we'll do that because the holly allows that we'll throw an extra sensor in there so we can read it and then very important make sure that every fitting is tight before you put it on there because just because it comes with a fitting in there doesn't mean that your fittings are tight put a little bit of lube on there snug them up and then you're confident that you're not going to have any leaks but you're going to check that anyway before you fire it up oh shoot i did want that down yeah that makes sense Okay, so the Dietchworks line um, is the middle of it is Teflon, so it's it works with all types of fuels, not just gas. So no problem running ethanol through here and diesel. Um, I find the best way to cut it because it is steel braided. Wrap some Teflon around, and that will keep the braid from kind of fraying, so you can get your fittings over top. Just a couple laps around, and then just take your grinder and cut straight through the middle. Now it's very important to cut this on a 90 degree angle. The, if it's on an angle, you run the risk of not sealing all the way. So that's probably the most crucial part, is to make sure that you're cutting it on a 90 degree angle. The best thing is to get a set of these jaw clamps, just magnets that fit on your uh, vise, so that it doesn't damage anything. You can take your line, and just put it, it'll hold it nice and tight, all the different sizes. And that'll give you a nice 90 degree starting point. So you can just take 90, take your grinder 90 degrees to this, and then you got a nice cut. Their fitting consists of three parts. Just your little spin on, uh, your furrow, and then your, your fitting itself. So with the tape still on it, um, it's got a nice big taper on this side, but you just want to squeeze this part right over top, squeeze that on, and then you can give yourself a little bit more working room. You can pull your Teflon out now. You can use uh, painter's tape as well. I don't really like, like using electrical tape because it gets gummy when you cut it. Now your furrow, the taper, fits into this fitting and squeezes it down on the end. But you want to take this fitting and put it so that the Teflon part goes in the middle and bottoms out all the way to the very tip of it right here. And then your steel braid goes around the outside there. And it's not that difficult. Can you see the, the line at the very end? Now this gets kind of tricky. It's easier to do with a straight fitting because there's less chance of cross threading. But with a 90 degree fitting, that's why I'm showing this on a 90 degree, is that it gets tricky because if you're pushing on the fitting with your hand, trying to get the thread started, you have a tendency to tip the fitting and cross thread it. You don't want that. At this point, you stick it all the way in. And now you can start the threads. but. What I find works better is starting them by hand if you can, and if not, uh, take a screwdriver and just put pressure on this while you're turning this fitting into, into here, one or the other. Um, this tool will also hold this nut and you can spin this fitting into the nut, or you can try by hand just to catch those first threads. And if you do it by hand and just catch those first couple threads, it really guarantees that you don't cross thread. Um, but if you can't get it, um, open up your vise again. 
Just hold the fitting now in your jaw. Just lean on that fitting and then tighten it in until you're guaranteed you're started and you're not cross-threaded. If you see a little sliver coming up, um, that is terrible and you probably ruined the, th the fitting. Don't try and use it because we're working with fuel and one fuel leak will burn your entire project to the ground. Just remember that. <laughs> now I know that I'm uh, nice and straight. It's going in nice and even. I can keep going until it's snug. You don't have to bottom it out. doesn't necessarily mean that the the one fitting bottoms out against the other just when you feel about that you're going to strip it stop about a quarter turn before you wreck something and that's it all right so we're going to throw this on the regulator run the whole line right back to the fuel tank and uh then once we know our exact measurement we'll cut it and we'll take the whole line back out again and put the uh, fitting on the other end very very good system, very tight system. If you do it right, don't get frustrated. And the Teflon is amazing um, just because you can run all your different fuels on it. Here we go. Okay, so this 90 is on the return side. The return side, you wanna make it look nice and neat. But if you use 90s on your feed side, which we're using 8N for, every 90 degree fitting is like adding three feet of length of hose to your fuel system because of the restriction in that 90 the fuel has to change direction it's like adding three feet which is like that much so if you have six 90s in there you basically added an entire length of fuel uh, length of line that your pump has to work that much harder to pump the fuel through just keep that in mind i know it looks pretty but if you are going for high horsepower or whatever, you do want to limit those 90s to as few as possible. Okay, so the 100 micron filter um, protects the pump and then the 5 micron filter protects the injectors. So um, I ran the fuel lines nicely uh, down the back of the engine and down the firewall. Um, I'm not going to secure them just in that one corner yet until I have the exhaust on. But I know where the filter is going to go and give myself a little extra. I'm going to take the line back off again, mount the filter, um, the five micron, because I'm working backwards, and then I'll bring the line up onto where the tank. It's almost the end of the day, so the tank's paint should be dry tomorrow. I can mount the tank. I have to uh, install my extra fitting into my fuel pump yet. I had to run and grab some uh, oxygen and some brazing rod because I ran out and we can braze that fitting in and then hook up both the lines, figure out our ohms for our meter and we are golden. Okay, so there it is. I asked Vince to take this and he's like, it's too thin, man. It's not gonna work. So, it's a proud moment for me. I was able to do something that Vince didn't want to, couldn't, or probably just didn't want to, but braised it all together. Um, nice, nice fitting on the top there. Braised the steel, new steel line into the back, um, and braised it together to the sending unit. You can see the difference in the size. Uh, that was the main feed. This is now the section. That is the return, so suction is always a little bit bigger. Brazing is a really nice option. It, uh, as long as it's clean, it's fairly easy to do. Just keep your temperature on the thicker steel and then dab a little bit on there and then you can see it just flow it and you can kind of point it around with your brazing tip. So, very confident in this. We're gonna let this cool down and uh, throw that back in the tank tomorrow. I got a couple things to do on the convertible frame. So we'll get going on that and uh, yeah, you'll see that in another video. Okay, so mistakes were made. Can't raise that pipe to that pipe because then that changes the continuity. So a couple zip ties do the same. And I thought I should do that, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do a professional braze it. Don't do that. And when you're testing it, like that has to be a pass-through, so that has to not make contact with that. Um, don't lay it on the bench or across the tool. 
where everything's touching because it'll mess up your own meters. So um, pretty straightforward that the resistance has to be different. It doesn't matter what the resistance is, it just has to be different from the bottom when it is at the top. And uh, you can just tell the holly whatever that is and that's full and empty, but um, it's always zero if you're touching this and you think that it's the screw going through the housing, but it's not. It's not, get some sleep boys. There's like 40 minutes wasted there. That's okay, we learn, here we go. Okay, I got the sending unit back in again. I put a new uh, line on there with a Deutsch connector. So we'll get that plumbed in with the lines. Um, got the vent and plumb that in before the throttle body. And then uh, those are the fittings we'll use for the lines. And we're good to put that back into that beauty. Here we go. Okay, so working backwards. My, my, uh, we've got our filter in our frame rail here. That's our five micron filter, protect the injectors. So we got to make a line that goes to the out of the pump. Flow goes that way. And then the flow goes to your pre-filter, which protects you. Remember, we're working backwards, feeding your pump. And then from this goes to our nice little sending unit that we made. Now these have a nice bracket that comes with it. I didn't get a bracket with my uh, pump. So I found these um, turbo clamps that uh, are the perfect fit for around here and then i just made a quick little bracket on the bottom welded that in there so i can bolt that in place put a little piece of rubber in here this will go nicely in here and that ain't going nowhere that's beautiful look at that oh splash some paint on it first and then we'll make a bracket for the tank the tank is back inside already that's uh pretty straightforward now it helps when you drain the fuel out of it obviously but the tank is already back up again you gotta make little grunting noises and a little, ah, come on and then it'll go in i don't think you, you guys needed to see that step but now we'll make a bracket that uh is can hold both of these uh nice and securely now i'm gonna make a bracket i think that holds it down and i'm gonna put sound deadening on the top of it um so this will be held like this so all the noise will get pushed down hopefully get caught in the wind as it pulls it uh as the wind goes underneath the truck hopefully take most of the noise away but we'll see how loud this pump is to begin with so uh we'll make a nice little bracket probably out of aluminum i'm just going to quickly cut this out and then these will mount on the fuel tank and the filter will mount here the pump will mount there um i'll still put sound deadening on the back but um and maybe on the front Tin foil on the one side and it's a sticky black stuff on the other. So I'll put that on the inside and the outside. And then got my holes drilled for my filter already. Waiting for the paint to dry on my pump. And then we can put the pump right there. Nice, here we go. Um, just a quick reminder, if you put a little bit of WD-40 on your razors when you cut this, it doesn't gum up the knife and it cuts way nicer. I got the filter mounted, waiting for the brackets to dry paint-wise, so might as well carry on. Going to run the cooling lines. There's just 5 8 coolant heater hose that goes from one side and the other side up nice and neat to my heater core. And there she be. Um, we do have air conditioning, but we'll worry about that later. Okay, so we got some 5 8 heater hose. Now that fits nice and tight around my heater core, but it's really tight on my fittings here for the uh, the Coyote. So, what you do is you just take the coffee and uh, open her up there. Make sure she's good and hot. And just dip the old heater hose into uh, your coffee. Let that end warm up just a little bit. Now, if, you, if you're a little bit of a wuss and you have to add a bunch of milk and sugar, well, that's gonna cool your coffee down. This is not gonna work as effectively. If you drink a black, then uh, you're ahead of the game because it's a nice hot coffee. Don't spill that all over you. Because that coffee is hot. If you're a tea drinker, maybe just wait to throw the bag in until after you do this because otherwise that'd be gross. Anyway, just loosen up the end of that hose a little bit and then she just slips on. Like she's just meant to be up there. Everything modern sucks. Because everything's plastic and you can't push too hard because then you break it. And then, and then you gotta go straight to Ford for new fittings and then that's a pain. And anyway, I'm gonna root that really nice underneath and uh, make it look factory. Here we go. 
Because I got my mug here. I was just made a mug, just a little holder here. Um, this was the power steering reservoir that was on the Mustang. So it already has all the right hoses. Everything's already there um, and it worked, so might as well. I was gonna paint it. Somebody painted it gray or like a silver. I don't know why you paint aluminum to look like aluminum because it's already aluminum. So there's a couple few little flakes on there yet, but it'll match the radiator nicely right here. So made a little bracket that will attach it to there. And then um, put a little bit of heat shrink just around the bends for the clamp. And I'll put a little bit of heat shrink around the hose clamps and then it'll look not not quite factory but pretty darn good and really it's hidden behind here power steering is nice and easy to get at coolant's nice and easy to get at look at that right there so we're all set but i want to get it done wonderful Okay, I got our upper radiator hose done. We've got our two cooling lines going nice and neat up into our heater core. And we've got our lower feed line going into the pump. So in the meantime, the brackets have dried and turned out very, very nice. And I use these turbo clamps because I don't know where they go and I have no use for them, but they got this really nice cup in there. So what I can do is just take this uh, vacuum line, just kind of stick that in there. That will hold the pump super nice and um, we'll give it a little bit of cushioning and that will bolt nicely right there. Oh, so beautiful. Here we go. Okay, that's how that looks. Very happy with that. Other than these, these angles on the bottom, I welded them to like the half moon so that it still has a chance to compress and one was off a little bit so now they're just off slightly and I have to live with that the rest of my life. Good thing I'll never see it underneath. A uh, little note that earplugs make great little plugs for these eight ands um, just in case. And your filter. I just want to go over filter real quick because your filter has a sealed part and an open part and you want the open part to push towards the out so that all of your crap gets stuck on the outside of the filter. So your fuel comes in, goes all the way around, gets squeezed through this filter and pushed it that way. If you accidentally put it backwards, you'll never get fuel. And you don't want it filtering through the inside of this, you'll never get a clean. So put this together, throw the filter in. Uh, be the, uh, I'm probably gonna have to build, build a little brace on the bottom of this to go to the bottom of that fuel tank. I will do that a little bit later. I'm short just a couple 8 and fittings, um, but not a big deal because I gotta put this all together and then take it all apart again, clean everything one more time, blow everything out, make sure the lines are all clean. And then before we fire up the engine, we're gonna run fuel through it, straight through all the hoses, collect all that in a jerry can, make sure that that's all nice and clean. And, uh, um, oh wow, oh I didn't know this. It uh, will also catch all your steel shavings. Nice. What a good filter. Anyway, sorry. Put it all together, take it all apart, clean it, put it all back together again, flush it, then we're good. <laughs> the last 20% takes 80% of the time. Here we go. Okay. So we got the line coming through the pre filter. Missing the line between the pre-filter and the pump. Pump you want nice and low to the bottom of the tank and as close as possible to the tank. That'll make it last longer, make it happier. We're being tied up nice and neat all the way down. Missing the exhaust to our post filter and the frame right there. Nice and easy to get at. Um, did put the exhaust up to make sure that I rooted the hoses as far away from the exhaust as possible. We got lots of room there on either side. If we would have went closer here, it would have been a lot tighter. So we went up and then went over and from there into the fuel rail, then back out of the fuel rail to your regulator and then right back down again. 
So um, I'm gonna leave the exhaust up just for now, but we can run a new uh, brake line that's bent up a little nicer. Start running all of our electrical. While the transmission's out, we got Dodge in the driveway, so that'll make a nice four wheel drive shifter. I don't know exactly where we're gonna put that. We didn't close this off for now, but uh, that will end up somewhere right about here. I need a linkage to go from here to about here. It's crazy. Derek and I put the sniper on it. We did that all in a day. Just the fuel system, and I did paint the truck, uh, I guess. But even just the, if we didn't paint the truck, just the fuel system install took like more than a day, day and a half by the time I got everything done, and I'm still not done because I'm missing fittings. <laughs> you see what a really nice job uh, takes, and then also the security of knowing that that little hose isn't going to blow in the middle and pump all your fuel onto the road and possibly ignite and burn the truck and the occupants down. So it's, yeah, it's a much better feeling. Here we go. Because I got my washer or my overflow tank. I thought about putting a heater. It doesn't really fit nice there. Thought about somewhere over here. It's too far away. And then I'm like, there's a lot of space in between here, yeah? And there's a couple hoses that I kind of want to hide in the front, so I can put it right here. And it actually looks pretty good. Right there. If, uh... But, um, that was from the Mustang. This is from a Bronco. So I can get Vince to plug this one off. We don't need this one in here. We might need the fitting in there yet. But we can move that just to, we can drill and tap that right there or right there, somewhere. I don't know, we'll put that somewhere. I don't know if we need it. No, that's just the overflow. We don't need that at all. But the only thing is our flex light fan is just a touch too big for the side here. This mounts this and that thing mounts this thing. I have to make this fit in lower, um, but I also have to secure it properly. I don't really want to secure it to the top here. This is always pretty flimsy. So, got to take the radiator out. I'm going to, I don't know if I can squeeze it between here. If I just take the seal off and slide it over, I might be able to do that. If not, I might just have to notch one side just slightly. This is a different size than the outlet on the thermostat. So I might just cut that off and put a smaller one in there or ask Vince what's better to weld. I'll get him to weld this first. If it welds okay, then we'll weld in a smaller outlet on the radiator hose. If that doesn't work very well, I'll get him to weld the cast piece and put a bigger one on here. Um, then uh, we can also weld a couple tabs on here just to mount the shroud properly and maybe one on the top to, to go grab the top ones, at least on the bottom. And then we can mount our tank on here and then i'll get under wiring i promise I, I i'm getting there just thinking so i got one out and got all this nice long hose and then realized that i only need this much so i have this much hose for sale on ebay if anybody wants it a thousand dollars plus shipping and it takes six months to ship it just heads up here we go because for the power steering with the vnr uh these this pressure line from the pump when you deadhead it, can hit 3,000 PSI. We always go to uh, VNR, and this is good for 5,000 PSI. So I get them to put one fitting on, and I never get them to crimp the other side because you never know exactly how it's gonna fit until you get it on. So um, to fit into the other fitting, uh, this is just the old one. I just cut the old hose off. I'm going to braise this fitting onto here, and then that will be the straight fitting which would be like this. So we'll put it down into the pump. We'll make sure it's nice and neat underneath here. And then the intake will be here and that will hide that hose so you won't be able to see it. It'll be perfect. I'm gonna cut the threads off of here on the lathe, drill that out just a touch so it'll actually fit on there. And then it'll look factory. Here we go.
is I got the hose on the bottom and I can tweak this one a little bit. I can, that's why I left that extra little loop in there just so I can bend it, so I can bring it closer to the cylinder head. But the reason I don't crimp this side is because I should have went with a 45 and not a 90. 90, 45 would have fit much better. I get the option to go over top and keep it tight there. That'll look okay. Or try to sneak it through underneath here. But uh, regardless, I gotta go back to VNR anyway. So I can trade this in for a 45 and try again. But I'll do that next time I'm driving. I'm gonna carry on with wiring. I, I gotta get to this wiring. <laughs> That's my old. It's like God just buy a new one. I'm like, like looking around all the spider spots. I'm like crying. <laughs> Okay, for the overflow bottle, I had to make this bracket um, just to catch the two bolts on the fan shroud and move the washer bottle over. And then just made a little bracket that curls around the shroud and then riveted it in place. So that'll hold the bottom right there with that mount on the hole and the two are in there. And we got radiators done. Got some fittings for VNR. We're going to do an eight and um, uh, cooler lines so the out from the transmission will come to the top of the radiator where it will cool as it's going down This out will go to another cooler in the front of the, the radiator and then from there out that cooler back into the transmission again Look how beautiful that looks all in there nice and tight except no wait Should have measured twice because even though I put it off center because I looked at it the radiator is not centered in the in front of the engine so um i don't know what's going on i think the engine might be off here. all right whatever i gotta move this over okay so what most people hate is the wiring and i love wiring and i hate wiring my thing is you just need to do wiring when you have enough time and in, and you're in the right headspace to do a good job because the whole point of wiring is like makeup. You don't want anybody to know that you actually did it. If you did a nice job, all your wires should be run nice and neatly parallel, tucked underneath. So when you pop the hood, you're like, well, where's all the wires? And this Bronco actually has a ton of wiring. This is the wiring harness for uh, the Coyote from Holly. It's got the uh, cam controllers as well, so we can still advance and retard our camshafts, which is just a nicer drivability. But if you look at this harness, it's about twice as much length of wire than there is on a typical LS. There's a lot more happening. And um, I didn't do a, like a fantastic job on the Mustang. This is out of the Mustang because I knew I would be pulling it back out again. So I didn't cut any wires. I left all my, my supplies and my feeds nice and long. And I wanted to do that because I hate splicing and I hate butt connectors but I, I want it to be nice and neat at the same time. So uh, Holly gives you lots of length and that almost bothers me sometimes too because you, you don't want to cut it, but you have to like fold it over because it's way too long. So it's, there's a way of running certain things certain ways so that you, you use the full length of the wire and it looks like it was supposed to be done that way. On top of that, we've got the transmission controller from USS Shift. So here's a bunch more wiring that all needs to be connected. That all needs to talk to the, uh, the engine as well. And um, for our ignition, we're going with our digital guard dog. So this, these are the cards, stick them in your wallet and we don't need a key. We got push button start. I'm really excited to uh, get this thing set up, um, making it as modern as possible. But 
That means I'm going to be in wiring for a few days actually. Um, and uh, I, I just tackle one thing at a time. I know the Holly system. I know where those wires go. I know, I know which ones need power and ground. So we'll get those set up nice and neat and then we'll start adding the other systems to it so that we can make this thing talk. All the while, Hughes Performance is um, rebuilding our transmission and we can't start this thing until that transmission's back because I need the uh, bell housing to hold my starter in place. But we can crank things over, we can, we can hook everything else up, make sure the fuel pump kicks on. Basically, if the fuel pump kicks on, then the Holly's happy and it should run. Should run. Here we go. With this wiring harness, it's much easier to start at the end. So plug in all your sensors. Uh, with the Holly Terminator, everything's uh, marked really easy. You got your exa exhaust bank one, uh, bank two. So bank two is on the driver's side. Bank one is on the passenger side. On the passenger side, it's one, two, three, four. And then on bank two, on the driver's side, it's five, six, seven, eight. So rather than the LSs, which go back and forth, um, it's very, very straightforward. The harness gives you the option to do a manual throttle body or a uh, electric throttle body. So we're not using the TPS and the uh, IAC on this one. These aren't individual runs that go back to the computer. They, they Y into uh, at the back there. So as I did with the Mustang, I'm just gonna tuck these into the back and uh, underneath the cover, we've got covers over here. Your cam sensors are at the back of the head along with your knock sensor sensor and um, your coolant temperature sensors on the back of the uh, passenger head. Oil pressure sensors down below here, uh, but it's very, very straightforward. Just try not to wreck these tabs. Try to keep them on there because you never know when you do have to disassemble stuff again. But um, it is very, very crucial to have good grounds. So there is one uh, wire at the back of the, the wiring harness that says connect to cylinder head only, and that's to fire the coils because the coils need to be grounded properly. You have to add a ground to that as well. The only thing connecting, because the intakes are plastic, it doesn't have the uh, continuity going through that plastic. It's relying on the continuity on the cylinder head to go through the head gaskets, but that acts as, a, as an insulator. So what I do is I connect both cylinder heads together with a ground, connect the ground from the uh, wiring harness to one of those ports. On the other port, I run the cylinder head ground over to the engine block and the engine block to the frame. Um, it might be overdoing it, but I've never had any issues by putting too many grounds on it. I put, I put uh, grounds all over the F-350. If you check out that wiring harness, everybody's saying, oh, it's gonna go all over. No, it's not. It's gonna go through the path of least resistance and it's gonna connect from the sensor to whatever ground is closest. Don't forget to ground your body because um, that will affect your radio and gauges and lights and that as well. Um, and then we'll make some really nice uh, wires for the alternator and the starter as well. Painted by battery tray, so that's almost dry. We can put our battery in there. And I think rather than putting the computer under the hood, uh, because we don't have anything going here, I'm going to mount the, uh, the ECU right here. Um, try to keep as many wires out from under the dash as possible. So let's go make some grounds. Okay, so for grounds, um, I got this wire off Amazon. I'm a little bit disappointed in it. I don't think I'd use it for high current. Um, it's not speaker wire, uh, it, but it's it's very fine strands. But um, I just got this kit from Princess Auto, just a bunch of different uh, ends on it. I'm running low, I need to run back. And then this um, crimper from Amazon. And I actually really, really like this thing. It's got all the different dies, go right up to massive uh, four aught cable. Um, and then right down to tiny little cable. So all you do is put the dies in there, stick your cable end in there, make sure that you're bottomed out and then nice and slow, um, it just crimps that so nice and tight that there's no worries. Another crimper, if you don't wanna splurge on that, is this little guy, but it's not as nice. It puts one dent in there, and, and we used this one when we were on the road, but as you can see, this does a really nice hexagon crimp all the way around, so I like doing my fittings there like that. Um, it's a ground, so you don't have to, but I do like finishing them off. 
um, by just putting a little bit of shrink tubing over top. And then for my power cables, this one's at the back of the head, nobody's ever gonna see it, but I do put uh, sheathing around it, and then I put the shrink tube, I stop the sheathing right about here, and I put the, shrink, the sheathing inside the shrink tubing, and then shrink it, and then you got a really nice cover, looks like a really nice professional cable, but doesn't really cost much. Of course, I have my nice little butane tor torch, and that's laying somewhere, and I can't find it, so I'll just do it like this. Okay, the engine's pretty well wired up, um, other than, you know, that, that mess. But put the battery tray in there, got our battery in place, we're gonna run our grounds. Now I did buy heavier cable, this is two gauge, um, and the strands are a bit thicker, so it's a little bit more stiff. But a big issue that we had with the Bronco with the 302 in there is that if it was hot, it wouldn't start again. It was just, uh, it would take about a half hour for it to cool down before you were able to start it again. That was a giant pain in the butt. We put a new starter on it, did the same thing. We ran heavy cable through it, did the same thing, but um, we should have that fixed with this one, but we still need plenty of heavy cable. So um, this is the good stuff. So we got um, solder on ready, uh, battery clamps. We'll put this on the top of the battery and then we'll run some clamps to the side of it for all of our holly stuff. Um, I always like to use the um, dual post so that this acts like a giant capacitor. So if you screw something up, it doesn't fry the computer because the battery absorbs all of your oopses. So um, we'll start by running the cable down to the a good ground on the block um, with, this, with this end and we'll crimp that on and then we'll just heat this up and solder that on um, once we have the right link. Here we go. So back there I have a wire for a fuel pressure sensor and I wasn't going to put it in because we're not racing. I guess we know when we're exactly out of fuel, but the fuel gauge will tell us that too. So, um, but Dietzwerk had that fitting in there to allow for a pressure sensor. So might as well pop in a 100 PSI sensor. I had to get a 90 for it because otherwise it wouldn't fit behind the cover but now we got a nice seal back there and you won't even be able to see that ever because the cover is on Okay, this side of the engine looks much better. Everything's kind of nice and neat, tucked along the side. We've got our uh, air vacuum behind the throttle plate going to our brake booster, and then it's teed off, and that goes to your MAP sensor, manifold absolute pressure, which just goes on to here. So I have a hose for that. This is the throttle control, the electronic throttle control, and the wire is way too long. The wire comes all the way out here. Um, and you can't cut or modify that because it says do not cut or modify. It's probably because they're RCF or RCA or something controlled um, for interference. So there's probably a shield around here and they don't want you wrecking that. So to make up for that hose, we're just going to tuck it underneath and add it to this wire loom. 
because then I can go around the engine, around the back, snake it through, and then go back. Now, kind of sucks though, because the wire for the plug is way too long, but then the wire for the throttle is just barely long enough. So this is gonna determine where the computer's gonna go, because this also says, do not cut or modify. And then there it says throttle. So this has to go back inside the cab and make it to the throttle cable. So the longest I can make this, I can go through that hole there, I think. I'll make that bigger, put a grommet through there. Might as well put the throttle cable through the throttle cable hole. So we'll put that through there and then run that back and then mount the computer. So it's pretty neat here, actually. I like, this is still messy, but um, I'm gonna make a holder for this so it looks um, nice and neat here and stack all these wires up. I can hide a lot of stuff underneath the air conditioning, but I'm missing my two VVT controllers and I have them somewhere. And generally I'm pretty good at putting them somewhere. I don't lose too many parts. So of a thousand parts in a vehicle, I might lose like one or two. I can't find them. So I'm not sure you don't need those um, necessarily. It'll run fine without it, but I think Scott does have a second set. So I'll borrow those off of him. And the second I borrow those off of him, I'll find mine. So then I can give them back. I have to go back to Scott at North Towns next week anyway, because uh, Kevin's, uh, we found an engine for his skid steer. So we found a crankshaft because the crankshaft's no good. So head over to DGHD if you're bored after this video. Um, there's lots of good stuff happening over there. Um, I'll grab those and then I can mount, make a nice little holder, to kind of stack everything. You don't want these up like this because the water gets in. So you can lay them down if you want. Preferably it's having the plugs pointing down. And then you can see these pretty lights at the same time too. But I'm just trying to get rid of all this wiring so it looks neat. So I'm going to keep tucking stuff away. Still got to do my positive uh, battery cable. Just keep plugging away. Okay, for the positive battery cable, I'm going to try something a little different. I took out basically one section of wire, just it's hard to tell on the camera. And then I stripped that down just slightly there, just the sheathing, and I'm gonna lay that exactly in there so it's still a perfect circle and try to solder it in that way. So what I'm gonna do is zip tie that together so that the hose doesn't change or the two wires don't change. I'll probably just spray some silicone in there and then heat shrink that and then that will supply the rest of the truck. See if that works, here we go. Now these pre-filled lead terminals with solder inside already have the solder paste in there as well. So when you heat it up, you'll see it bubble first like boil and that's the soldering paste before the solder melts. So before I stick the cable in, I like to put a little bit of paste on the end of the cable and then as I'm warming this up, I warm the cable up at the same time. And that allows a more seamless marriage of the two because if you jam that in cold, that female part doesn't like that. So you gotta warm everything up. And lube everything up and then everybody has a good time. Now it's pretty good. A couple of uh, strands stuck up the side. And that's kind of unavoidable. You kind of get one shot of this. Hold it in place for a while so that it doesn't change at all. And cut those zip ties and uh, give her a good hard pull. Wasn't sure if this was a good idea because this is gonna feed, this little wire is gonna feed the main vehicle uh, harness. So if this dies, I lose my lights and my gauges and things like that. But uh, we will see. It'll probably be fine. It actually turned out really nice. Sweet. For the alternator, that plug, I uh, just made a new cable. I don't even know what aught this is, or gauge this is, or what it is, but it's about this size. It's about, compared to my pinky, about half, third. The Americans like to use size measurements that way, right? It's about half a pinky size. Anyway, <laughs> we'll run, a, run that right over to the starter. So there's a couple holders along the oil pan, we'll do that. So there's the fuel lines, all tucked up nice and neat. And then my O2 sensor's in there. 
um, all of that gets put in there. Um, we've got all the wires nicely bundled in the back there. It looks kind of messy and jumbled, but that is just the way the Holly harness is. There's nothing you can do about that. Fuel lines are all nice and neat and tidy, and it looks really good back here. I've got the ground going from the frame to the block, from the block to the cylinder head, from the cylinder head to the other cylinder head, and then we will do one more um, from the battery to the body, and then we'll do one at the back of the truck from the body to the frame because of the rubber mouse. The starter, I just put it up there. That gets bolted into the transmission, but just kind of put it there so that that is the alternator wire, and I have to run my positive yet for my um, battery cable. But um, that is the negative ground right there, nice and big and thick on the block, nice and close to the starter. And we should be good. I'm actually really, really happy with that. Um, that turned out amazing. And it wasn't so bad. For you guys that think that's a lot, it really isn't. It's just they give you extra wires in case you do a different layout and put the computer, say, in the trunk or in the in the glove box or whatever. They have to give you extra. I don't want it in there um, because I don't. <laughs> and uh, that is what it is. So take your time, do it right, and do it right the first time. More than likely I have to cut all these cables off because I'm adding wires, but that's it for now. <laughs> Here we go. And there it is. The engine mostly wired and mostly plumbed. It's all in there, it's all together. I gotta drill a hole for that yet. I gotta borrow a 90 degree drill so I can drill just into there and hold that hose up a little bit. But um, doesn't that look much better? Once you just take away a bunch of the stuff start eliminating it. it's not so bad now look just that little bit of wiring there left to do i gotta order a bunch of parts i need to order a few more fittings so that i can do my transmission lines and my oil filter lines the oil filter relocate and then i'm missing the vvt controllers that are supposed to plug into here these two and those two we are ordered an air filter assembly that's going to end up in this corner from holly while all those other parts are coming I'm on to something else. Uh, we got lots of other exciting stuff going on. Kevin's uh, got quite a bit going on on the heavy duty channel. We got a 90C with uh, the PTO pins out of it, the shift collar. So we did that this week. And also his skid steer uh, found another used engine. So putting a bunch of stuff together for that. So definitely check that out. And don't forget to check out thebossgarage.com to enter to win that toolbox because you gotta get out there and work on it. Because if you're not filthy, you're not rich. Here we go.